Okay, so I bet you've made it through the front, right? And you didn't have to look onto the back yet. Um, all right, so Walt Whitman, I, I just have a soft spot in my heart for this guy. Um, he is my absolute favorite poet, okay? Like I said, I know y'all think that I feel that way about all these guys that we read, but in terms of poetry, this one's special, okay? And I think it's probably because when I started college, there was one particular evening, and I think I was starting the actual classes the next day, and I was in my dorm room, and my roommate and my sweet mates wanted me to go out. And for whatever reason, I was just like, yeah, I don't, I'm not into that. I'm not, I don't feel like that tonight. I think I'll just kind of stay in. And I did, right? And I stayed in and I pulled, y'all was such a nerd, I swear. I pulled a collection of poetry off my bookshelf and I started reading and I, you know, it kind of fell open to Walt Whitman and I started reading Whitten, Whitman and for whatever reason, at that point, I needed something, and he was there. You know what I mean? Like, he just, he's this voice that's very empowering, and he had a lot of confidence and so, in, in some ways, and he didn't in others. But I don't know. He was just something that um, kind of spoke to me at that moment, so I've always had a bit of a soft spot for him ever since. So, looking at the bio, tell me something that you highlighted, Gracie. You dropped out of school yeah, third class period, third time. That was something that people brought up as being interesting. So, drops out of, at 11, and it's not because he's a bad student. I mean, you know, back then, even if you were a great student, if your family needed help paying bills, you would do what you had to do. And for Whitman, that was to go to work, even at 11. Kind of crazy. So his first job, first real job. Now, he didn't go to work as an editor for a newspaper when he was 11, okay? He did like odd jobs and that kind of stuff that kids were able to do. But as an adult, his first, I guess, career job was as an editor for the Brooklyn Eagle, but he gets fired. Why? Because there's an opposition to slavery. Yeah, and y'all, if you think about it, this is pre-Civil War, but there would be a lot of people who lived in New York who were opposed to slavery. I mean, it's a free state, right? So he must have been like real aggressive in his stance for him to, to actually get fired. And I want y'all to understand, I don't know that it's in here. Did I type this in? I don't know that I did. But he goes from Brooklyn, okay, and he travels all the way down the East Coast. And he travels down into the South where he finally winds up in New Orleans. And he gets a job at... A New Orleans newspaper, I think it's the Times Picayune, which is either still hanging on in business or it may have already closed, but very recently. I'd have to look that up. Um, I don't know if they've just downsized or what, but so he goes all the way down the East Coast, winds up in New Orleans, and along that long journey, because that would take a while, okay, he meets all kinds of people right? Rich people, poor people, working class folks. And it's really where he kind of falls in love with like the American spirit, the American people. And that trip has a lot of impact on him. In fact, you want to jot this down. Walt Whitman really wanted to be the voice of the American people. Okay, that was ultimately what he wanted to be remembered as, the voice of the American people. He is a distinctly American poet, okay? Now, tell me something else from the bio that you thought was interesting, Jennifer. Um, that, he, that Emerson called the um, Absolutely. Okay, so his first edition 
of poetry was called Leaves of Grass. Okay? If you, and it's published in 1855. All right? Now, he continues to, like, add to it and tweak some of the earlier poems all throughout his lifetime. I want to say when it's all said and done, there were maybe, like, 14 editions of this. So, it goes from being kind of a slim volume to something that's pretty hefty by the end of his lifetime. But when it comes out in 1855, he wants to be the voice of the American people, but the American people aren't quite ready for him. He speaks very frankly, very honestly about topics that were just not spoken about in the Victorian period. He talks about lust. And he talks about sex. And this is a period in time when people put little skirts on their table legs. Because you don't want to leave a bare leg, even if it's a table leg, because that might be a little suggestive. It's never been something that, you know, <laughs> I've been into myself. But, yeah, this is a very buttoned up time in society, right? It's called the Victorian period, by the way, why? Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria, that's right, who was on the throne in England at the time, okay? So people are pretty uptight in terms of their manners and their morals. And here comes Whitman who's gonna talk about like, you know, body parts and stuff, okay? So when he comes out with Leaves of Grass, Emerson, whom we all know, right? Emerson's impressed because it's completely original. But most folks are a bit shocked, <laughs> right? They don't really know what to make of it. So it's important to know that he wants to be the voice of the American people, but the American people, it takes them a while to kind of warm up to him. And that's going to be important when we get to our little spider poem later on, okay? So Emerson says it is original and it is the quote-unquote most extraordinary piece of wit and wisdom that America has yet to contribute, which is pretty dang impressive, especially coming from Emerson, okay? Now, here's the thing. Whitman is a kind of marketing genius, all right? He gets a letter from Emerson after he publishes his first edition, Leaves of Grass, and Emerson tells him this, right? This is incredible, this is original, this is amazing stuff. And without Emerson's permission, Whitman takes the compliment from the letter that he'd received and publishes it as part of the preface to his second edition. And so when Emerson finds out that Whitman did this, he's a little perturbed because he never gave any permission for him to actually be quoted in the preface to the second edition. So. Um, we're going to talk or listen to that because we're going to see a, a documentary next week that kind of talks about Emerson and Whitman and how they interacted, okay? All right, so a couple of things you want to jot down. Probably at the top close to his name, he is a writer of romanticism, so I guess you could shorten that to he is a romantic writer. He is also in part transcendental very much into like nature and what it can teach us. Also very much into independence, self-reliance. But most of all, if we were to put him in like a category, you would have to say that he is America's first modern poet. He is truly America's first modern poet. So his work reads very contemporary. Not all of it. The second poem, O Captain, My Captain, is not, okay? But a poem like Miracles reads very fresh. Like it reads like something that would have been written, you know, this week, right? So even though he's coming out of the Victorian period and the modern period in, in literature usually isn't seen until like, we don't really recognize the modern period until the early 1900s, his stuff is so original that he is like the father 
of modern poetry. Okay, and that's kind of cool. All right, so um, if you look at leaves of grass, what do you usually think of when you think of grass and the little stems that grow out? What do we call those? Blades. Yeah, so even the name is kind of strange. I mean, nobody thinks of blades of grass as leaves, but Whitman does. Whitman has kind of a fresh look at the things around us, which leads me to miracles. All right, now, we just finished Our Town. And Our Town very much is about taking in the little moments of life, right? To me, our town is very much connected to what Whitman is saying in this poem, okay? All right, so um, Drew, I want you to read the first five lines. Y'all are going to have to mark these lines because I don't have line numbers. Jennifer, the second five lines. Bella, the third five lines. Leanne, the fourth five lines. And John, maybe the fifth five lines, and whatever you don't finish, I'll finish for us on miracles. Okay? So y'all got to go down and kind of block it out. All right, Drew, you got the easy part. Oh, Lord, you're going to ask me to repeat that? Drew the first. I think it was Jennifer the second, right? Maybe Leanne the third. It was me. You're the third. You're the fourth. John's the fifth. And then whatever's left over, I'll read. Okay? All right, miracles. Now, if you haven't already marked lines that you like, make sure you do it this time around, okay? All right, Drew, start us off. Why? Who makes so much a miracle? As to me, I know nothing else but miracles. Whether I walk the streets of Manhattan, or dart my sights over the roofs of houses towards the sky, or wade with naked feet along the beach, just in the edge of the water. Or stand under trees in the woods, or park by day, anything I love, or sleep in bed at night, or animals feeding in the fields, or birds, or the wonderful wonderfulness of insects in the air, or the wonderfulness of the sun down, or the stars shining so quiet and bright, or the exquisite, delicate, thin curve of the new moon in the spring, or whether I go among those I like best. In that, in that like me best, mechanics, boatmen, farmers, or among the taverns, or the soiree, which is a party, soiree, or the opera, or stand along while looking at the movements of machinery, or behold children at their sports, or the admirable sight of the perfect old man, or the perfect old woman, or the sick in hospitals, or the dead carried to the bur bur burial. Burial. <laughs> For my own eyes and figure in the glass, these with the rest, one and all, are to me miracles. The whole referring at each distinct in its, in its place. To me, every hour of the light and dark is a miracle. Every cubic inch of space is a miracle. Every square yard of the surface of the earth is spread with the same. Every foot of the interior swarms with the same. Every spear of grass, the frames, limbs, organs of men and women, and all that concerns them, all these are to me unspeakably perfect miracles. To me, the sea is a continual miracle. The fishes that swim, the rocks, the motion of the waves, the ships with men in them, what stranger miracles are there? All right, so on the surface, we've got a pretty simple poem, right? I mean, it's not hard to understand. He sees the world around him. And within the ordinary, you know, images, he sees the extraordinary, which is pretty, pretty dang awesome, right? The language is easy. You know, I think the hardest word in here is soiree, which means a party, okay? So we have this written in free verse, might want to make a note of that, and free verse you probably already know, but free verse is poetry that has no set rhyme, no set meter. So what is it that makes it poetry then? In this particular case, I think what makes it poetry is the imagery, because it's got some gorgeous imagery, 
okay? It also has some like parallelism. You can tell that right off the bat. Where do you see the parallelism? Or. Yeah, all the lines that begin with or and then a few that begin with every. So, um, all right, let's kind of break this down a little bit. Let me talk about some of my favorite lines, okay? All right, if you look down line five, he says, he's walking around, he's doing this, he's doing that, he's seeing these miracles, and he says, wade with naked feet along the beach just in the edge of the water. Remember that this is written in the Victorian period, and you're not going to have people talk about anything naked, even if it is just your feet. So that would be a line that we today are like, yeah, whatever, that's fine. We don't really think a lot of it, but that would have probably, you know, raised a few eyebrows back in those days, okay? The naked feet along the beach, right? And then we have this one or talk by day with anyone I love, or sleep in the bed at night with anyone I love. Hmm. All right, so what's the implication there? Yeah, he's gonna bed whomever. It's his business, right? And that is also miraculous because he's looking around him and he's seeing the miracles all around right and he goes back and he says whether i walk the streets of manhattan or dart my eye or wade with naked feet or stand under trees or talk by day with anyone i love or sleep in the bed at night with anyone i love yeah so people would be pretty you know appalled by that line okay and then he goes on and on and on and i love that about where Bella started reading, or maybe towards the end, he talks about the wonderfulness of the insects in the air and the wonderfulness of the sundown. Because in my mind, I kind of picture him trying to like convey his emotions and there's just not quite the right word. So he comes up with wonderfulness. And I think that that's really kind of cool. To me, I imagine Whitman, and he's got these long, he always writes in these like long strung out ideas and sentences. It's like he has so much going on, so much emotion, so many thoughts, so many ideas that it's like the page can't contain him. You know, you can imagine that his notes are like margin to margin. You know what I mean? Like he uses all the space. I mean, that's just kind of who this guy is. By the way, he is a New Yorker. And with that comes all those traits that you think of when you think of people who are from New York. He is brash, he is bold, he is often like in your face. Which, you know, some folks love and accept and some folks like are put off by that also kind of mimics how his poetry was and how it was received by many, but also like questioned by many. Does that make sense to you guys? So moving on, I gotta tell you, this line is probably the most beautiful line that you will read this year. And we're gonna be reading Fitzgerald, so that's saying something, okay? This is kind of, yeah, it's not quite the middle. He says, the exquisite delicate thin curve of the new moon in spring gorgeous gorgeous imagery okay beautifully 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 written now if you look towards the end he he lists you know whitman's gonna list a lot of stuff it's called cataloging when you get into literature and you've got a writer that like lists things as part of the poem you call it cataloging okay and it kind of goes on for a while right well towards the end he says, every cubic inch of space is a miracle. Every square yard of the surface of the earth is spread with the same. Every spear of grass, okay? These are to me unspeakably perfect miracles. And then finally he says, the sea is a continual miracle, probably because the sea is always moving, right? And he says, Within the sea, you've got the waves and you've got 
the rocks, and you have the fish, and then you have the ships. And what are inside the ships? Men. What stranger miracles are there? So what's like the strangest? And in this case, I think strange is good. It's like a positive thing. So what are the strangest miracles? Ground it in the text, Christian. Well, the last thing he refers to is the men, the people. Like we are the strangest miracles of them all. And if that doesn't get you folks, there's something wrong with you. Okay, Avery, you're cynical. That's got to touch something inside that little cynical mind of yours, I know. All right, so this is super, you know, um, it's, it's rather informal. It's long. It's kind of drawn out. It's very typical Whitman. This is his style. If you flip it over, though. We get a whole different type of poem from the same author. Very famous. Oh, Captain, my Captain. Okay? Cassidy, read the first stanza. Christian, second stanza. And uh, Nicole, third stanza. You know I was going to call on you, did You had that feeling. I could tell. I could see it in your eyes. All right. Oh, Captain, my Captain. And you need to know that this is written after Lincoln was assassinated. Okay? All right, start us off. Oh, Captain, my Captain, Shh. our fearful trip is done. The ship has, has weathered every rack. The prize we sought is won. The port is near. The bells are here. The people are ex exulting. Exulting, which means they're joyous. While follow, while follow eyes with steady keel, the vessel grim and barren. But oh heart, 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 oh the bleeding drops of red, where on the deck my captain lies, fallen cold and dead. Oh captain, my captain, rise up and hear the bells, rise up for you the flag is flung for the bugle trails, for you boutiques, bouquets, <laughs> and ribbon wreaths, for you the shores are crowding. For you they call the swarm mass, their eager faces turn to the captain, dear father. This arm beneath their head, it's some dream that on deck keeps falling for the day. My captain was not answering, his lips were pale and still. My father has not been my arm, he has no help, no will. The ship is anchored safe and sound, its voice close and dumb. From fearful trip, the vexed ship comes in with our big one. Exo, O shore, the wind obeys. All right, so first of all, let's get the symbolism out of the way. Okay, clearly the captain is Lincoln, which means what is the ship that was steered through the storm? Nation. Yes, the nation. Absolutely. Remember, Lincoln wanted to preserve the Union, and he did. Okay. And that means the storm, the fearful storm, is, of course, what? The war. The war itself. Okay? So we get that. And if you didn't, jot that stuff down. The captain is Lincoln. The ship is the United States. And the storm that he steered us through is the war. And, y'all, you may not know this, but I want to say, and somebody can fact check me on this, I want to say Lee surrendered at Appomattox on April 9th, 1865. I think it was April 9th, okay? Lincoln is shot April 14th, the night of April 14th. He survives till about 1 a.m. and he dies on April 15th. What a lot of folks may not realize is that the war is over. When he's assassinated, I mean, he'd steered us through the greatest storm, yet double tragedy, because he was a good man, right? Double tragedy, he doesn't get to, you know, exult that the war is over. I mean, he's only alive a couple of days, and then, I mean, he's, he's done. So, I mean, you've got this tragic loss 
of not just the captain of the ship, but what else does Whitman call him? Father. Like the father of the country. So let me ask you this. This language is different, isn't it? This diction, remember diction is word choice, dictionary. This diction is different. Exult, O shores, and ring, O bells. What's different about this language than what we found in miracles? Yeah, it's super formal, like super formal. Look at the structure. I mean, you can eyeball this and tell not only that it's got rhyme, it's got a set meter, but the structure of the poem is quite set. Why would that be? That's not the way Whitman usually writes. Why the formal diction, formal structure, formal formal rhyme? Why? Yes, absolutely. Because the subject requires it. Okay, Gracie. Well, also he does. He is in favor. Whitman is in favor of the abolition of slavery, and so. And Abraham Lincoln's the one that made that happen. So yeah, and and it there's a story that said uh, okay. So Whitman, um, I don't think it's up in his bio here, and I did read over it. I promise you, but um, Whitman's brother had been a soldier in the war. Okay, and he's injured and in a Union hospital in Washington, D.C. And Whitman actually went to Washington, D.C. and nursed his brother back to health and also stayed on as a nurse um, or a medic or whatnot during the war. So he spent a lot of time in D.C. Well, back in those days, y'all, you didn't have like the incredible security that you would have around our president today. And so Abraham Lincoln was known to like, you know, ride out in D.C. when he felt like getting out and going for a ride, or he would walk about the town. And so it's said that Whitman had had a number of times where he could see Lincoln and realize that Lincoln looked like he had the weight of the world on his shoulders, right? You've seen pictures of Lincoln. I mean, he had to get those wrinkles somewhere, right? So he knows that Lincoln got them through this war and he views Lincoln as the father of the country. And for him, it is personal. In fact, in the poem, it says, everyone else is exulting because the war is over. But I can't do that yet because I am still, you know, what, grieving over the loss of this great human being. Drew. Um, I mean, it's just like, the reason like the paragraphs are shaped like where it's like a gun it's well assassination. well um i you know i don't know that their guns would have been in this shape because this is shaped more like one of our modern guns right but you know what it it but hang on drew you're on to something because there is something with the shape of this people have noted that it kind of looks like ships like naval vessels Ish, right? And it's oh, captain, my captain. Did he like originally write it like that? Oh yeah, no. This is the way that the stanzas would have been stylized. So it is. You're on to something, Drew. Kinda, ha kinda. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you got something. Yeah. I don't think their guns. I don't believe their guns were shaped like that. I think that's kind of a modern thing. But um. The inner redneck in me appreciates the observation, uh, but I think if anything, it's supposed to kind of look like ships, right? Like what? It like Say it again. It was definitely intentional. Oh yes, no, it was intentional. You do not shape your poem like this without there being intent. Okay. All right, guys. So here's what I need y'all to do. I want you guys, and you won't have to do it on Canvas because I'm going to see that you've done this. I'm going to watch you do it right now, okay? But the third poem I want to look at is called A Noiseless Patient Spider. And it's pretty formal for Whitman especially, but I need you to not just read it, but respond to the questions at the top. Do that now. You've got about eight minutes. 
So you should be able to get through that and not have to worry about it until we get back. Okay, do that now. Um, I mean, you've already, we've annotated these two really together, but you do need to do this one. Okay. All right. Yeah. Sometimes I'll put something in canvas, you know, knowing that my virtual kids have to do it, but then we, you being here, you get the chance to do it with it, the group. Does that make sense? Okay. 